Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to the Vantage Seminar. And this is the series of talks on developments in isogeny-based cryptosystems. And uh, today we're very happy to have uh, Stephen Galbraith, who is here talking about isogeny graphs, computational problems, and applications to cryptography. Uh, and Stephen, is it okay if I video this talk? Yes, that's fine. Wonderful. And feel free to ask questions during the talk, um, either, um, either verbally or in the chat window. Okay, well, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, well, thanks for the invitation. It's uh, really nice to be online and, and seeing you guys. Um, and uh, the talk is pretty much an overview of lots of things. So hopefully there'll be something interesting for everyone. Um, Rachel asked me about the pictures. So the, the picture on the left is just a picture of downtown Auckland. The, uh, the center picture is of a, um, that's on the university campus. So that's a kind of garden and the, the, the tower is the oldest building on the, on the campus. And the picture on the right is from the uh, Maori uh, uh, space on, on campus where we have uh, welcome events and so forth. So anyone who went to AsiaCrypt in 2015 will have been, will have been there. All right, so I'm mostly going to be talking about volcanoes and things. So I'm trying to keep Drew happy. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about uh, some of the some structures in the super singular isogeny graph. And we'll get on to the seaside crypto system uh, later on. And maybe if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about signatures. So I'm not talking about SIDH at all. That's not deliberate, it's just the way the talk ended up falling out. But um, but yeah, I'm actually mainly focusing on things that aren't broken right now. Uh, and yeah, I'm happy to take interruptions if anyone's got a question. So I assume people know what a Cayley graph is. So we have, I'm, I'm gonna be only talking about finite abelian groups. So we've got a finite group and we've got some subset, which is usually closed under inversion. And we've got edges in the graph coming from um, pairs of the group element and the, the product with one of the elements in the set S. So there's some terrible hand-drawn pictures of Cayley graphs. And the whole point is Cayley graphs have, have a lot of symmetry because you can act on the whole thing with the, with the group. Uh, Schrei graphs seem to have more than one definition in the literature, but one of them is that if you have a group acting on a set, it's the, the graph formed by taking the elements of the set and again taking some subset of the group and acting on it. So the, the, element, the edges in the Schrei graph are going to be a set element and its um, image under an element on, of some subset of the of the graph and again usually the set s is going to be closed under inversion so it's so it's an undirected graph so the the isogeny graphs um in the ordinary case i'm going to be thinking of are going to be shri graphs according to this definition and i'm assuming that uh christian Lauter's talk earlier today will have mentioned expanders and if um, the key um, the, the key points I want to say about expanders is you don't you really talk about expander families so so we should really talk about a family of graphs that's parameterized by by some parameter and expansion is really some kind of statement about how this family of graphs behaves asymptotically but I'm going to kind of sweep that under the carpet and just talk about an expander graph as if, as if that makes sense. Uh, and the property uh, I'm interested in, I'm interested in graphs that have sort of a compact representation. So if you're a graph theorist, you usually represent graphs by, you know, uh, some adjacency matrix or some incident structure, which, which whose size is kind of linear in the number of vertices. But I'm interested in graphs that have some some very small representation, but it's a very large, large graph, right? So I'm interested in a graph which I can specify by, for example, saying a prime P and I get some graph with P vertices, uh, but I only took log, log P bits to, to write it down. So, so I'm interested in being able to have a short description of a very large graph uh, or, or, a, or 
a short description of elements in a family of large graphs. The third bullet point is the, really the distinguished feature of expander graphs from the context I'm interested in, which is that if you take um, polynomial length random walks, you get close to a uniform distribution on the vertices. So you can, you can take that as a, as a definition of an expander graph for the moment. So you can, you can get clo as close as you want to uniform distribution on the vertex set by, um, by relatively short random walks. And if you're looking at Cayley graphs of abelian groups, and you fix the degree of the, or fix the, well, yes, fix the degree of vertices or fix the size of the, of the set S and let the group G go to infinity, well, these are not going to be expanders. So abelian groups, there's too many relations, there's too much collapsing of the, um, um, of the structure. And so you don't get expander families from, from Cayley graphs of abelian groups. But in isogeny crypto, we, again, we sometimes will have situations where the number of elements in the set S is also growing. Um, so they're not, they're, they're, they're families of graphs with the, where the degree of vertices is also not, not constant. And that would not be interesting from the classical expander graphs literature, but you can still get something which has this uniform, uniform mixing property. Um, so when we talk about, when we get to seaside, if you really wanted to, to think about seaside, you'd think about really about the, the degree of the, if, if, as, as your security parameter goes up or as your, as your size of your graph goes up, you'd have your, your, um, your degree of each vertex in the graph would also, would also grow, but not too badly. So that's this final comment here. This is very hand wavy, <clears throat> but if you, you, can, you can come up with interesting graphs, even from abelian groups which still have this close to uniform property. Okay, let me give you a more concrete example of what I might be talking about. Um, oh yeah, so the, the computational problem we're interested in is given a starting vertex and an end vertex, can you find a path between them? So this, this, this doesn't make sense. This is an easy problem classically in, in graph theory, but this makes sense if I've got a, if I've got a graph that has a, a, a short, a short description of the graph and if you can give we have short descriptions of vertices and you can verify for yourself that a vertex does lie in the graph using using its short description but the graph is exponentially large then it makes sense that i could give you two vertices in the graph you can convince yourself that these are vertices in the graph but it could be hard for you to determine a path a path between them so in the in the, in the context of super singular isogeny graphs this, for example, this problem makes perfect sense because you can convince yourself that, that two J invariants are corresponding to super singular curves and therefore there should be a path between them. Um, but it, it could be hard for you to determine that path. So that's the, that's the high level computational problem behind a lot of this cryptography. And here's a um, very simple example of, and this is a, a Cayley graph. This is just the, the group, the, I'm just talking about the integers modulo P. So I've got um, some large prime P and some small primes L. And I'm thinking of the, um, the, the, the graph as the vertices are just the integers mod P and my edges are going from, from G to L times G for one of these small primes L modulo P, right? So this is just a simple, simple graph. I'll come back to these conditions in a moment in, in point three. And so the idea is if I, if I take a random walk in this graph, I'm just multiplying a bunch of these small primes together. And let's, let's take the starting vertex to be one. So the initial vertex is one, the integer one. And then I, I take a random walk, which is multiplying by small primes L. And then I publish some final, some final vertex, which is just an integer mod P, which I'm calling U. And so this, this integer U is just some product of powers of the small primes. And uh, understanding the path I took, or even understanding another path, you would have to find some sequence of exponents, which, which gives this equality. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna make an even slightly, slightly stronger claim. I'm gonna give a sort of L infinity bound on the, on the norm of this vector. So this is a, I, I claim this is in general, a, a, not an easy computational problem. So for, for you know, 1000 bit primes or something, it might be hard for you to work out um, some exponent sequence that 
that gives um, that gives you this element u. So what are the conditions I've got? I've got a condition here, which is basically saying I've got about as many choices of the exponent vector as p. So I'm getting, I should be getting a reasonably good coverage of the integers mod p. If you wanted to get close to uniform distribution, you'd want this to be substantially or sort of noticeably bigger than p. But so this first condition is just saying I've got about p different exponent vectors. So I might expect close to p different values for u. The second condition is just saying you get some, some um, modular reduction, right? I mean, obviously, obviously, if the product of the li to the ei's is less than p, this is not a hard problem. We can factor smooth, smooth integers. So the this, this second condition is just showing that I get, I get some actual, some actual non-trivial reduction mod p to make this problem not, not easy. All right, this next bullet point is just saying that if I took one prime L, this is the discrete log problem, right? The discrete log problem says, if given, given some value U, what power of L is it? That's not interesting from the graph theory point of view because I've taken an exponentially long walk, right? I'm really interested in situations where I'm taking a polynomial sized walk to get um, some kind of uniform mixing. So the, 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 context here is I'm hoping that the sum of the absolute values of the EIs would be somehow polynomial in, in log P. All right, I hope everyone's happy with a simple example. Any questions at this point? Okay, so my first, my first non-trivial remark is that even if discrete log is easy, uh, if k is large enough, this problem may still be hard. So this problem may still be hard even for a quantum computer. So what am I claiming? I'm claiming that taking a random element mod p and trying to write it as a product of powers of small primes with, a, with an L infinity bound on the, on the vector of exponents could be hard even, even if discrete logs are easy. And that's because it's a lattice problem. So again, P is a large prime. We've got some small primes. It doesn't even matter if they're primes, to be honest. Uh, and we define this lattice to be, uh, well, that's the definition of the lattice. And it's easy to see that this is a, um, it's got zero in it and it's closed under addition. So suppose I've got a target value U which is a product of, of small powers of the allies. Uh, now, what do I do? How do I, how do I find this exponent vector EI? What I do is I just find um, some other integers Y that, uh, so I can write U as a product of the LI to the YI. And I can do that by choosing K minus one of them at random and solving discrete logs. This is, I'm now assuming I can solve discrete logs. Maybe I have a quantum computer or something. So if I just choose k minus one of them at random and solve discrete logs, I um, and maybe this value is not in the subgroup generated by L1, in which case I choose the yi's randomly. Oh, I should have said that I'm, I'm assuming all the time here that the li's generate, multiplicatively generate zp star. Um, yeah, so if I choose some other choice for the, for the yi's, I should, I should eventually get in the subgroup generated by L1. So I can find a solution to the problem u equals a product of powers of li, but these, these ones are not necessarily small enough. This, this last one, y1, it might be very large. So I've got a vector, y1 up to yk, which solves this problem. And now um, if I, I notice that also there's this unknown solution, the, the ei's, and if I take the y vector minus the e vector, then of course I get a lattice point because because, um, because they're both equal to u. And by definition, EI is short in the infinity norm. And so what that means is that X is a lattice point, which is close to Y. So I've solved, got a solution Y, and I've convinced myself that there's a lattice point X, which is close to Y. And so if I can compute a lattice point, lattice point close to Y with respect to the infinity norm, then um, that's a Y minus X would be a candidate solution for E. So this is how you might go about trying to find this vector E using uh, an algorithm for the closest vector problem. And that works okay in practice when K is small, 
But if we take k to be large, like a thousand or something, um, then this is not at all uh, practical. So this, this kind of problem can be a hard problem even when discrete logs are easy. Yeah, because close effect problem in general is hard. Uh, and if you like this sort of number theory, I can highly recommend this paper by uh, Ducas and Pierrot. Um, it's a really cute paper which uses these kind of lattices, but com completely backwards. It says, hmm, I want a lattice where CVP is easy, and then it uses factoring smooth numbers as a, as a closest vector algorithm. So if you haven't seen this paper, it's really cute. Any questions? Seems okay. Right, isogenies. I'm kind of assuming everyone in this call knows about isogenies. Otherwise, why, why are you here? Um, but if you don't, uh, well, maps between elliptic curves. And the really important thing is they're essentially determined by their kernel. So given a subgroup, there's up to isomorphism, assuming separable, there's a unique isogeny with kernel G. Okay, so what are the graphs I'm interested in? And I'm starting off thinking about the ordinary case. So the graphs I'm thinking of, uh, you're gonna take a set of isomorphism classes of elliptic curves, and the edges are going to be isogenies, and they're typically gonna be isogenies of a, of a, of a fixed degree, um, a prime degree, like two or three, or maybe um, there may be like a set of, set of small primes. Um, so yeah, the vertex set is, a, is the, is a, okay, and at this point, I'm probably gonna be looking at uh, isomorphism over the algebraic closure. So I'll just take the vertex set to be the J variance of the elliptic curves. And these are all the elliptic curves isogenous to some, to some base curve E0. And the edges, uh, yeah, so here I'm talking about F, I'll come back to this point of isomorphism later, but we're, at the moment we're really working with J variance. And the edges are just gonna be, um, in this case, directed edges from uh, E to E prime, if there's an isogeny from E to E prime, whose degree is in the set S. And then because of the dual isogeny, you can almost get away with thinking of this as an undirected graph, except there's a couple of awkward vertices sometimes due to automorphisms. So the notation I'll sometimes use is, is this, which indicates that we're, um, this is somehow the isogeny class of E0. So E0 is just determining an isogeny class. Um, the curve is over FQ, but the isomorphisms are over FQ bar and the edges are corresponding to the primes in the set S. So here's uh, an example, which I will explain in detail later. This is an image I stole from Dustin Moody. So the vertices are J invariants, so they're isomorphism classes of elliptic curves, and the degree here is four, so I know that this is a three isogeny graph. So each of these edges is an isogeny of degree three. Um, and some of these vertices have degree four, and then the ones on the outside only have degree one. The edges are kind of invisible. Um, and I'll explain that in a minute. But that's what we're talking about. And there's a huge difference between the ordinary and the super singular case, which I'll talk about more later. But basically in the ordinary case, we do have this Kaylee Schreier um, situation. So we have this, I mean, the, the, the graph I just showed you clearly has symmetries. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty looking graph. Um, that's what we get from the theory of complex multiplication. The super singular case is much more strange because we've got Cartunian algebras and there's, there's less structure. And that's really the main topic of my talk is trying to find some nice structures within the super singular graph. I see I've spelled Schreier wrong. All right, so let me talk about some of this um, class group action, which is the core of all this. And so if you've seen the complex multiplication theory, you, you're familiar with, with all of this. So let's suppose I've got an elliptic curve whose endomorphism ring is isomorphic to some order in an imaginary quadratic field. 
and imagine I've got an invertible O ideal, then I can define this subgroup of the elliptic curve. So this goes back to, to, to Waterhouse and, and probably earlier. Um, so it's the set of all points that are in the kernel of all of these endomorphisms, right? So A, A is inside the endomorphism ring. The endomorphism ring is O, A is an O ideal. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a proper ideal, it's contained in, in the endomorphism ring. So every element in this ideal A is an endomorphism and endomorphisms have some kernel. And so the, the, um, this, this um, kernel subgroup is the set of all points that are killed by all the endomorphisms in A. And this is a finite subgroup because each of these endomorphisms has finite kernel. And so because you've got a finite subgroup, you can quotient out by it. And there's an isogeny with that kernel. And so we define the, the action of the ideal to be the, the image curve of the isogeny whose kernel is this kernel. And so this is an action of an ideal on the set of elliptic curves, but then you can show that this is, if I take um, two ideals that are uh, equivalent and they um, differ by a principal ideal, then in fact, the image curve, the image curves are isomorphic. So the action depends, if I look at the J invariant of A star E, it only depends on the ideal class of A. And so we get an action of the, of the ideal class group of um, invertible, uh, invertible ideals on the set of elliptic curves with endomorphism ring O. So this is why we're in the context of a Schreier graph. We have an abelian group acting on a set of isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. So in terms of graphs, I can fix any order in, a, in an imaginary quadratic field. I can let X be the set of isomorphism classes of, um, yeah, in this case, I'm only talking about the ordinary case, ordinary curves with that endomorphism ring over the same field FQ. G is the class group, and then we have this action. And so if I take some subset S of the, of the class group, then I get this uh, Schreier graph with um, the vertex set being the entire set X of isomorphism classes and the edges corresponding to the action by the, the ideal classes in the set S. So this is, well, this is a graph that I can talk about. Um, maybe I'll just go back to the image I had. So this image is actually, there's, there's a bit more going on in this image. So this image actually has three different um, orders going on. So forget about. I'm um, just look at the just look at the um, heptagon. I think it is this, the, the heptagon in the center. Forget about all the other stuff going on. The balloons that are flying off. The heptagon in the center is is a graph such as the one I described. The set has size seven. The 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 group um, is of order seven, and the the graph is just this um, just the circuit. So that would be that would be an example of this construction where the order is the maximal order in a certain imaginary quadratic field. The class number is seven. The set X is those seven isomorphism classes of elliptic curves whose endomorphism ring is the maximal order. Uh, if we're talking about ordinary elliptic curves, then we have the Frobenius map and the endomorphism ring There's basically um, only limited options for the endomorphism ring of an ordinary elliptic curve. It contains Z and Frobenius, and it's contained in the maximal order of the imaginary quadratic field defined by Frobenius, which is um, Q square root T squared minus four Q. So the endomorphism ring is somewhere between the maximal order and this order Z pi. And sometimes these things are all equal and there's a unique choice of the endomorphism ring. And sometimes they're not equal and there's some kind of lattice of possible values for the endomorphism ring. And it's, it can be shown that every, every order between these two things um, does appear as the endomorphism ring for some ordinary curves. And here's uh, uh, something that is explicitly talked about in David Cole's thesis. If you have two elliptic curves, E1 and E2, and they're both, um, the endomorphism rings are orders in the same imaginary quadratic field, 
Uh, and if O1 is contained in O2, then any isogeny from E1 to E2 has degree divisible by this, this index. Oh, I've done the index the wrong way around. <laughs> Oops, yeah, that should be. I, I've used these slides before and yet typos still persist. Um, anyway, the, so the point is, if you're going to change between between the, the orders, you've got to, whatever that index is, your isogeny has to be divisible by that. Um, so this is not, not too hard to prove, and you can find it in Cole's thesis. And so, um, put another way, if you've got an isogeny um, that, uh, that doesn't have degree uh, divisible by any of these possible indexes, then you stay in the same, the same level. And those are the ones corresponding to invertible ideals. And if you have isogenies that, that change the level, then they're not corresponding to invertible ideals in the, in the, uh, on the order. All right, so the main point is the, to realize that there's only finitely many possible layers. Whatever your, Frobenius is giving you a kind of lower bound. So you've got, you've got your, your maximal order, and you've got your Frobenius, and then you've got whichever orders are in between. And those are the sort of layers in your, in your graph. Or the, 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 I haven't really defined the graph on the whole thing. I've defined graphs for each layer. So what's going on here is that there's, um, so again, this is the isogeny graph where all the isogenies have degree three. So the set S is just the, the um, isogenies of degree three. So here there's three layers. The thing at the top called the crater of the volcano, that's the endomorphism ring, the curves whose endomorphism ring is the maximal order. Then there's an index three suborder, and that's this sort of next layer down here, which has two, two neighbors of the, for each vertex on the crater, there's two neighbors. They're all the order with index three. And then there's another order, um, index three inside that, which has these, um, and that's the Frobenius, that's the Z Frobenius. And that's where all these final sort of balloons come from. And then that you, you don't go any lower because, because you've always got to contain the Frobenius. If you took three isogenies going below there, um, they wouldn't be defined over, over the ground field FQ anymore. They would be defined over some extension and they, they, they wouldn't have um, the Frobenius in them. So there are certainly, there are certainly iso three isogenies coming out, but they, they, they're over a bigger field. And so we don't, we don't, we, this, is, this is the curves defined over FQ for some, for some Q. So these are the isogeny volcanoes. And in terms of my definition of the graph, really there's, there's, there's a, I, the way I define it is, um, well, no, I mean, the, 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 the way I define the graph is okay, but in terms of the CM structure, the, the, you've really got the class group acting on, on the crater, and then as it acts on the crater, it sort of moves everything else around with it. Um, you do have a class group action on, the, on each of the layers individually, but that's not interesting with the prime three. You'd want to look at other primes, and then with other primes, you'd get some kind of action on the on the on the crater, and you get some other action on the on the things in the next level, and then you get some other action on the things in the next level down. So if I if I went away from the prime three and looked at looked at other other um, ideal ideal classes, I'd get some some interesting. I'd get some different graphs. Any questions? It sounds good. Cool. So we've got this class group action. So the obvious thing to do is something like Diffie Hellman. So I've got, uh, I, I, so, so yeah. So I guess the, the getting back to the isogeny problem. So I can think of, I can think of, um, I'll get onto this more with Seaside. I can, I can think of, um, instead of just using one prime L, I can think of taking many primes L and I can think of taking a product of the prime ideals of small norms and constructing an ideal class A. And so I can have a, a, secret, a secret ideal class and I can map um, A star E. And if I just, pub if I just the claim is if I publish uh, the starting curve E and the image curve, it's hard for you to figure out what the ideal class is. Um, so Alice can have a secret ideal class and can compute this. Bob can have a secret ideal class and can compute that. Alice can apply her secret ideal and compute that arrow. Bob can apply his secret ideal and compute that arrow. And so we get some kind of analog of the Diffie-Hellman protocol. And this, this kind of, um, as a concept, goes back to at least to Brassard and Young. Um, and then it was Cuvain's who first thought that isogenies could be a way of instantiating that and independently. Rostov, Sev, and Stolbinov. 
So this gives this gives this opens the door to cryptographic applications, and I'm not going to say any more about key exchange. Um, but yeah, the, the fundamental computational problem in this setting is given two elliptic curves, find an ideal class that corresponds to the action between them, and there's fairly simple classical algorithms for this. Uh, but the more interesting one is the quantum algorithm. So the quantum algorithm, there's a thing called the hidden shift problem. And this, this works for abelian groups, which, which we're working with. So you have two functions from G to a set S. This is a, sorry, a different set S. Um, yeah, uh, and so the, and the, and the claim is that the function G is a shift of the function F. Right, so I've got some function f, whatever it is, and it doesn't have to be have any particular structure. And I've got an, uh, uh, another function g, which is exactly the function f, but just the, the inputs are shifted by a secret group element s. Uh, and you've got some kind of these functions are described in some way, and the, the problem is to find the, the, the hidden shift. So, this is a problem that's came up in, in quantum algorithms. And Charles Shaw and Sukharov observed that this isogeny problem I'm talking about could be expressed in this way. So the function, the function, you just make it a function from the class group to the set of uh, J invariants for uh, of curves with this endomorphism ring. And the function takes an ideal class to B star E and the function G takes, applies B to the um, curve E prime and E prime is A star E. So of course, this is just a shift of F by, by the secret. Um, a. So you so this isogeny problem can be expressed as a hidden shift problem. And there's a there's a quantum algorithm for, for hidden shift due to Cooperberg. And there's been um, and it's has sub-exponential complexity uh, in assuming the unit cost for computing the functions f and g. Uh, so there's been a lot of follow-up work. There's been work by Regev about giving low quantum storage, there was a um, paper by Pikert and papers by Bonnetin and Schrottenlau. So there's been quite a lot of activity uh, on this algorithm because of the isogeny application. I'm not a quantum algorithms person, so I don't want to say much more than that. But uh, the, the upshot of this all is, is that this isogeny problem is still plausibly hard, but it's only sub-exponentially quantum hard. So this is a bit like, um, so that this complexity is like the um, uh, integer factoring before number fields serve, right? This is the this is the L one half type complexity. So this kind of um, isogeny action problem is a hard problem still, even for quantum computers, but not as hard as we would have liked. We would have liked a problem with exponential complexity, like what we thought SIDH was, but it turns out we were wrong. All right, um, yeah, so what I talked about was the ordinary case. Um, yeah, I, I'm gonna skip over this because I'm gonna run out of time. All right, so that was ordinary isogeny graphs. What do super singular isogeny graphs look like? They don't look like they have any structure at all. This is not a nice picture like the, the Dustin Moody's picture. This is just some weird looking thing. Uh, so what's going on here? The, I've taken uh, the prime 103. And what these vertices are, these are all the super singular J invariants in characteristic 103. And there are some of them are defined over F103. And some of them are defined over F103 squared. And that's these ones alpha an alpha bar, beta, and beta bar. These are the, these are just some elements in FP squared, which, and they're super singular J invariants. And obviously if, um, if alpha is a super singular J invariant, then alpha to the 103 is also a super singular J invariant. So I'm calling that alpha bar. Uh, and the two here says, this is the two isogeny graph. So these are all my super singular J invariants. And if I take, I'm claiming there's a, there's a two isogeny from, the curve with J invariant 23 to the curve with J invariant 24. And the curve with J invariant 24 has two different um, endomorphisms of order two um, because it's, that's 1728 or so. No, this one's 1728. Um, this is the one which has 
a two isogeny from 23 to 80, and then two different two isogenies from 80 to 23. Anyway, and, and we have, these are, these are all, the only these arrows are two isogenies. So this um, is a very small example, but it's enough to show it's that these graphs kind of look, they look horrible. They've got no kind of, there's, there's no sort of regularity. All the vertices look different. And of course, that's what expander graphs tend to look like. Expander graphs tend to look pretty, pretty kind of random because you, you need to be able to um, quickly get from anywhere to anywhere else. And structures and regularity and, and things often don't, um, don't help with that. So that's the super singular isogeny graph. So there's a question. Now, uh, it, it, yeah. The question about one of your previous slides. Do you want to do that now or later? About sure. The, um, it's a, it's about a whether it's the same as the abelian stabilizer problem. Shor's algorithm as a solution for f minus g. Is this the abelian stabilizer problem? Um, it's it's a different it's a different algorithm i mean the shaw's algorithm is polynomial time and and uh it really just um does some fourier transform and does a measurement and a result comes out whereas kuperberg is really something where you have to um do you it's, it's a much more complicated algorithm so at least from the point of view of the algorithms they're they're, they're very different um I, i'm not familiar with the abelian stabilizer problem so Sorry, I don't think I can help you. But yeah, if it was Shaw's algorithm, it would be a polynomial time algorithm rather than sub-exponential. All right, back to this thing. Yeah, so so the, <clears throat> at some point I got interested in the sub um, the subset of the vertices defined over FP. So super singular curves, some of them are defined over FP, some of them are defined over FP squared. And I was interested in the in the sort of the the, the, the curves defined over FP. So here's a bit of a, a summary of, of what's well known. So there are about p over twelve super singular curves, but most of them are defined over FP squared. And there's about square root p super singular curves that are defined over FP. And the, if, if you are super singular and defined over FP, then you have um, P plus one points and the Frobenius map behaves like square root minus P. So your endomorphism ring contains square root minus P. Now, uh, we need to be a little bit careful about endomorphism rings. So what is the endomorphism ring of an elliptic curve? So that's all the isogenies from E to itself and the zero map, and this is a ring. And uh, so you add and you compose ring under composition. And if you have a super singular elliptic curve, then the endomorphism ring is uh, maximal order in a Cotonian algebra ramified at P at infinity. Now I can also consider this object here that I'm calling end sub FP. So th <clears throat> this makes sense, this is for this is for elliptic curves E that are defined over FP. And here I restrict to the endomorphisms from E to itself, where the endomorphisms themselves are defined over FP. And there's a, <clears throat> there's a well-defined notion in algebraic geometry of what it means for a, a morphism to be defined over, over a field. So that's what I mean. And this is smaller. So, so some of these endomorphisms from E to itself are actually defined over, over an extension, and some of them are defined over FP. And what can be shown is that uh, the endomorphisms that are defined over FP are all just contained, all generated by Z and Frobenius. So they're all contained in the um, uh, the well, the field <laughs> generated by Frobenius. So um, so this endomorphism ring, the endomorphisms defined over FP is the same as all the endomorphisms intersected with the, the fields generated by Frobenius. So there's quite a lot of rigidity here. So if P is fixed, there's a vast variety and different opportunities for the endomorphism ring of E because there's all these weird maximal orders in the Quaternion algebra. But as soon as I 
restrict to curves defined over FP. And as soon as I restrict to endomorphisms defined over FP, there's actually only two possible, at most two possible values for this um, order O. It's either Z root P or if P is three mod four, it's Z one plus root P over two, that being the maximal order. So the, and the, and the number, and the number when I said that there are N equals big O root P super single elliptic curves, I, I have a much more precise claim. The number of super singular curves is the, the, the class number of, well, the sum of the class numbers of these two things, assuming that whichever ones are present. So there's a lot more structure to the J invariance defined over FP. So I'm taking this graph and I'm throwing away the alpha and the beta, right? So I throw away the alpha and the beta and the alpha bar and the beta bar. I say, I don't care. I'm just going to focus on the J invariance defined over FP. But still, it looks at the moment, the graph looked kind of weird. <clears throat> so what I did in the joint work with Christina Delfs was to consider the, um, the graph corresponding to the elliptic curves that were defined over the super singular elliptic curves whose J invariants are in FP. And the trick was, or one of the tricks is to change the original graph. We're looking at isomorphism over the algebraic closure. But from this point of view, you actually want to look at the FP isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. So where our vertices are going to be FP isomorphism classes of elliptic curves. And so we're not going to be able to label them with the J invariant uniquely because typically there's going to be two um, the, the quadratic twist will also be super singular um, and it will have the same J invariant, but it won't be isomorphic over FP. So um, yeah, I'll say more about that later. And then by when you construct, when you can when you look at this graph, because all the vertices in this graph have endomorphism ring uh, containing square root minus P, you do get some action of an ideal class group on this. So you get some regularity coming out. So I'll just go through this pictorially. So there's the, there's the original super singular graph. We throw away the alpha and the beta and we apply what we did in the paper with Delphs and you somehow get uh, a kind of a volcano that's turned into a coffee table. I think of this as a, as a coffee table rather than a volcano. Um, but you clearly get some kind of regularity here. So I put them side by side. So what's going on here? What I have is I have a two to one map, I have a, so again, we have to throw, we have to throw away the alpha and the beta and the alpha bar, beta bar. I'm, I'm focusing on the J invariance in FP. And I now have a two to one map from the graph on the right to the graph on the left, and it preserves adjacency. I mean, the, the isogenies are all still there. So let's go through this carefully. Let's look at this, um, I've, got, I've got 23 and 80. So I've got the edge there between 23 and 80. Well, that's fine. I've got an edge between 23 and 80 here, right? Um, and uh, I've got an edge from 80 to 80 where well, that corresponds to this, to this loop here. And I've got um, an edge from 69 to 69. That's, that's, that's the loop there. And I've got an edge from 69 to 34, 69 to 34. And I've got another edge from 69 to 34. And I've got, still got an edge from 69 to 34, right? So there's a, there's a two to one map from, the, from, from this to this, and it, but it still preserves. Every isogeny here just becomes an isogeny here. So anyway, we, we, we've, we were quite happy with the result because it, um, we were happy to somehow find some kind of structure, some, some regularity within the, within the super singular graph when you restrict it to the vertices over, over FP. And by the way, this is a rare example that's connected. This would not normally be connected. You know, the, remember this, the, this the, the super singular graph has P over 12 vertices. The, the vertices is only square root P vertices defined over FP. And normally they're sort of scattered around. So this is a law of small numbers problem in this example. Uh, yeah, and in terms of the, what's happening with the class group, so again, we've got the maximal order, that the, the top of the coffee table is the maximal order, and the, the legs are, are, are the order of index two, this is the two isogeny graph. <clears throat> and so if I act with the ideal class group, it's just rotating the, rotating the table around. So the class number is five in this example. And the, um, uh, uh, there's an ideal of norm two, who, which has order five, which generates the class group. So that's why we get this full, um, full rotation of, of order five. 
<clears throat> so here, are, here is uh, what happens if you match up the, the graph theory and the class group structure. So if you have P congruent to one mod four, then there's no, there's, there's instead of two layers, there's only one layer. So if P is one mod four, you've just got the one layer in your graph. Uh, if L splits, then you get, when we're talking about the L isogeny graph, if L splits, then you just get some cycles according to the, um, or the order of these ideals in the class group. <clears throat> if L is inert, there's nothing at all. It's just isolated vertices. And if P is three mod four, then you get these two layers, the maximal order and the index two sublayer. And if you're looking at primes not equal to two, then there's not much to say. You just get some action on the, on the two layers um, that, that match up. Uh, if the prime is two, which is the, the more interesting one when you've got these two layers, then if you get uh, the splitting, then you get the coffee table, which we just had. So this is the case where two splits. And like I said, two has order five in the class group. And so you get these are the, the, the that's what you get from the invertible two ideal uh, ideals of norm two. And then there's uh, another two isogeny going down, but that's not corresponding to an invertible ideal. Uh, and in the case where it's inert, where the prime two is inert in the, um, in the maximal order, <clears throat> then you get what I call stars. I don't have a picture of it, but that's where you get uh, a single vertex in the top. Um, the prime is inert, so there's no, there's no isogenies within that level. And there's just the three neighbors but they're all going down. So it's like a, it's like the, the one, one vertex at the top and three uh, vertices going down to the, to the order of index two. And if you compute <coughs> isogeny graphs, you will sometimes find these little stars like a little Mercedes band symbol. All right, so that was all, these are the, all the results from the paper I had with Christine de Delfs. And this, these sort of ideas eventually, led, oh, my time's nearly up. These sort of ideas led to the seaside um, crypto system. So this was uh, invented by Kastrick Langer, Martindale, Pani and Renas. And the idea is to come up with a, an efficient way, a very efficient way to do this class group crypto. And so the idea is you work with these super singular curves with J invariant and FP. So instead of working with the ordinary case, which is hard to make efficient or the full super singular case, which doesn't have the class group structure. The, the trick is to look at the elliptic curves that are super singular, but the J invariant is an FP. <clears throat> and we have this class group structure that I've been describing. Uh, and then really the trick is just to make the prime, uh, uh, form the prime as a product of small primes. And that's so that you can compute these um, small prime degree isogenies efficiently. So, the, so when, I'm, when we're talking about the class group and generating elements of the class group, we're going to be taking products. These primes are going to split. Each of these small primes is going to split in the class group, and we're going to take prime ideals above them, and that's how we're going to compute the isogenies. And it's going to be just like that example I did right at the beginning of the lecture, where I talked about powers of small primes modulo p. It's basically the same kind of idea. I can I can take products of powers of small prime ideals in the class group, and I get some kind of uniform mixing in the class group. Um, so I won't talk about the cryptography. The, the, the key point is that by the, the key idea of Seaside is that you could construct the prime nicely and that makes everything much more efficient. So the reason why you was the, the key point about super singular curves is having P plus one points. And so because you know you're going to have P plus one points, you can set up P so that your, your group order is, is convenient. That's really why super singular. I, an advert for some other cool papers. Um, there's a couple of really nice papers that are about using um, genus theory for, so this is using knowledge about um, essentially two power order elements in the class group to solve the decisional to the Hellman problem. So that's given E, A star E, where A is an ideal class, B star E and A, B star E, that's a sort of valid decision, uh, Diffie-Hellman tuple from E, A star E, B star E, C star E, where C is random. You can somehow distinguish these two cases by some, by some cool um, class group stuff and using pairings and really cool stuff. So I, I highly recommend these two papers. They're both really nice. 
Uh, and then a paper I do want to advertise, not so much the third one. The fourth one is a really cool paper that was just released recently. It's accepted to AsiaCrypt. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a bit computer science-y maybe for this audience, but it's, um, it's very cool. And it's about the, it builds on some work I did with, with others where we're showing how to, if you can solve the Diffie-Hellman problem, you can actually solve the, the discrete log problem quantumly. So this is a paper about quantum algorithm. We do use Shaw's algorithm in this paper. And this paper is about uh, extending it from unreliable oracles to, sorry, from reliable, perfect, we required a perfect, a perfect algorithm, perfect algorithm. And this extends it to a, to a, a less perfect algorithm. I really like this paper. So more reading for you to all do. I, yeah, and, and so somehow the key, key to all the seaside stuff is understanding how powers of prime ideals, how close they are uniform, where the powers are bounded in the infinity norm. So that's a number theoretic problem people might be interested in. Questions about understanding the class group are um, well known. Finding other actions, of course. So I think I'll stop there. I was going to talk about signatures, but I'll I'll was over that. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Stephen. Oh, this is a good time for questions. Would anyone like to ask anything? I think Drew's been busy finding the finding the URLs for everything. Yeah, he's fast at that. I had a question. I'm not sure it's um, completely precise, but when you look at that coffee table, um, what what does um, when you look at a curve and its sort of twist, uh, mm -hmm. what kind of distinguishes them within this coffee table, or is that not really a well posed question? Um, well, it's the endomorphism ring that distinguishes them, right? I mean, the, 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 what we're saying with this 80, for example, is there's a, there's a super singular curve of P plus one points and J invariant 80, and its endomorphism ring is, um, contains one plus root P over two. Mm -hmm. And then you look at its quadratic twist. Um, it's happens to be too isogenous to its quadratic twist. It doesn't have to be, but it, it is, right? There's, uh, there's other things that are not right here. We've got this 24 down here and this other 24 over there. They're not too isogenous. There's a curve and it's twist that are not too isogenous. But in the case of 80, it so happens that it is too isogenous to its quadratic twist. Yay. Um, but they don't have the same endomorphism ring. This, this one has endomorphism ring containing one plus root minus P over two, and this one doesn't. Um, and is, is that, is that, that seems perverse, doesn't it? But I don't know, how do we see that? Um, I don't know an easy way to see that actually. It seems, it seems perverse, right? <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's to do with the fact that the two isogeny is, I mean, that's what they do, right? The isogenies can change the endomorphism ring and it's a, it's a two isogeny that doesn't correspond to an invertible ideal. So it changes the, so it changes the endomorphism ring. Um, yeah. And so, so I, yeah, you really have to, I mean, you really have to assert, tag, tag them with the endomorphism. If, I think the way to, the way to formulate this precisely would be to, would be to, that they would be pairs of a J invariant and, and a description of the endomorphism ring or something like that. Yeah, let's see other questions. Well, can you tell us about signatures? Um, not, not, uh, yeah, this is a, so, so maybe I'll, maybe I'll back up a bit and say what, what, what are the key things we would like to be able to do in public key cryptography? So basically the two big things are encryption and signatures. So for encryption, you want something like key exchange. So Diffie-Hellman is a really basic, a basic tool. And from Diffie-Hellman, we get encryption schemes and lots of other interesting cryptographic functions. But the other thing we'd like to be able to do is authenticate and, and have, have uh, digital signatures. So that's a way of proving authenticity, right? I can, I can have a public key and then I can somehow demonstrate that, that I am the person who, who's associated with this public key. 
So ideally, if you want a kind of suite of cryptography, you want to have encryption schemes and signature schemes. And at some point with SIDH, we had quite efficient encryption schemes, relatively speaking. And so it was natural to try and get signature schemes. And it's been a real pain. We don't have good isogeny signature schemes at all. So this paper with Luca de Feo was, was some attempt to, to get um, signatures from, from these class group actions from Seaside. Uh, so what it boils down to is you're basically trying to prove to someone that you know. So you've got a, there's the, your public key is A star E and A you have, you've constructed it to be as a product of powers of small primes. And I didn't really talk about this, but that's just because that's the only thing we can compute. We can't compute, we, we can only compute isogenies of small prime degree. So I have, I am, I'm forced to use ideals of this form because I have to use values formula or something at some point. So what I want to do is I want to prove to someone that I know an ideal A that goes from E to EA without, without publishing it. I want to do some kind of zero knowledge proof that I know the ideal A. So that's the idea we're, we're talking about here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to try and convince you that I know an exponent vector. So I'm going to convince you that I know these numbers E1 up to EK that, so, so that, so that um, A star E is, the, is my public key. So that's, that's the idea is somehow a proof, a proof that you know this exponent vector. And, and so the idea that, that, that we had was, well, this, this is kind of like lattice crypto. You're trying to prove knowledge of some, of some integer vector without telling it. And so we basically used ideas from, from lattice cryptography. Um, so the idea is you publish some, you publish some random, some product of, of, of random stuff and you publish a, a third curve and then you get a, you get a, a, a challenge um, bit. And if the challenge is zero, you just publish your random stuff. And if the challenge is one, you publish the difference of these two vectors. And then someone can, can somehow be convinced by repeating this protocol many times, they can be convinced that, oh my gosh, you must know this vector E, which satisfies so that when I compute this ideal and compute this, um, so yeah, I haven't actually said what the verification process is, but the verification process is, is applying the response either to E or to EA. And, and, and so, so yeah, I should have had a di diagram. You've got E, EA, and then a third curve curly E, and you're showing that you know an, an isogeny going one of those two directions. Um, and yeah, the, 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 the thing I was quite happy with in the CSIM paper is we use this, these ideas from lattice cryptography um, Fiatchini with the boards, which is a, 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 something that that uh, Lubyshevsky invented, um, and uh, we use that idea. And then the subsequent work has has used the relation lattice. So there's a signature scheme called um, C fish. I'm sorry about all these names: C sides, C signs, C fish. It's it's an embarrassment to to mathematics. Um, Not at all. I think it's awesome. So my understanding is that the you know, so you get compact signatures, but the knock against these protocols is they're slow. I'm curious, what, what's the current state of the art? I mean, are they fast enough that people have actually implemented them? They're not, even that, they're not even that compact. The signatures aren't, aren't that great, um, but they're definitely, they're definitely. Oh, the, yeah, so the, the, one that, the one that is compact is the, um, uh, yeah, the, um, uh, blanked on the name, but yeah, the one that uses the quaternion algebras um, with Cole and Petit's authors, yeah. Um, that does have a short signature, but yeah, it's it's it's, it's slow. Um, I'm just trying to get a yeah. sense of how slow. Slow is in hopelessly impractical, or slower by a factor of x from what you would get from a lattice algorithm. Or um, I th I think I think hopelessly impractical. I mean, not competitive with lattices. That's that's the. But yeah, the, the good thing is all this stuff still still is um, secure. You you need you need less structure for signature schemes. So there's a there's there's um, it's just this weird thing that some some bits of mathematics are, are better for some things and, and not for others. So it's just a, it's just a weird thing that isogenies doesn't seem to be particularly useful for for signatures. Whereas um, and same with with the code based crypto, right? Code based crypto was always used for encryption, and it was hard to get code based signatures. There's been some progress on that. Multivariate crypto was good for signatures, but not good for encryption. Lattices is, you know, is good for everything. Um, 
but there, there's something about the something about the structure of isogenies doesn't doesn't make it particularly appealing for for signatures. So yeah, the moment's still not practical, I would say, isogeny signatures. And for so my last question, maybe I should stop and let other people ask questions. I have one more question though. Go for it, Drew. I guess my last question would be um, for ephemeral Diffie-Hellman, which seems like it's still a very important protocol and one that we're gonna want to be able to use long into the future. If SIDH can't be, um, can't address the attacks, the recent attacks, what's, yeah, what's our best, what's our best alternative? Not you mean just post-quantum, all, all of post-quantum? Yeah, yeah, all post-quantum. Um, yeah, if you want, if you want something, I mean, you know, lattices is, is obviously good for encryption, but if you want something really Diffie-Hellman-like, because, um, yeah, the lattices are not quite Diffie-Hellman-like. Um, yeah, I just want to set up, I just want to exchange my symmetric key quickly. I need to do this millions of times every day. Billions of times every day. Yeah, good question. I mean, I think, yeah, I guess the, I guess the, 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 the question from the lattice point of view is why are you doing that rather than just doing key transport. So with, with lattices, you know, where one person chooses the key and then encrypts it to the other person and then they both still have a shared key, right? It's just, um, it's just that one person could, I mean, the good thing about Diffie-Hellman is that it's got input by both people. And so it's, it's hard to, you know, Alice and Bob both send random stuff and then the key emerges out of their computation and neither of them really controls it. Whereas the, the alternative is to use public key encryption where one person chooses the key and sends it, sends it to the other person and that's the shared key. And for most applications, that's completely fine. Um, key transport rather than key agreement. But yeah, if you, if you wanted to do something where you really want that kind of Diffie-Hellman-like um, behavior, I mean, you could probably still do something like that with lattices, but you'd have to make some ordering of, ordering of messages. You have to commit to your messages before you send them and then send them an open or something. I mean, there are ways around it, but um, yeah, I don't have a good answer to your question, Drew. Good, that means there's work to be done. Maybe Seaside is good for that. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thanks again.